All right, Dr. Janie, over to you. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Hi, good morning, Mary Lynn. Good morning, Achima and Dora Maria and Jackie and, and Debbie and Dr. Tanji. Good morning, happy Thursday, Therapy Thursday. It is such a pleasure and so grateful and appreciative to be awoken to have another day of life. So we are approaching this day with gratitude and appreciation. And, you know, it's such a, a great day to really have some conversations as I'm listening uh, to not only the replay of Glenn Lundy's Rise and Grind this morning, but um, even Chima sharing some of the things that he's working on. You know, everything that we do, including coming here to Breakfast with Champions or LinkedIn or wherever we are on the social media platforms, it is about relationships. We're here to build relationships. We're here to build each other up. You know, Coco, we're here to get inspired, motivated, all the things. So today I want to take you on a journey to a little bit of a fun but inspirational and educational segments around the reality show, Love is Blind. So I don't know if anyone has watched Love is Blind on Netflix, uh, Emmy nominated Love is Blind, if that was something that you watched, go ahead and put it in the chat. But I, I had watched last night the reunion show and I wanna share some lessons, relationship lessons from Love is Blind season six. And if you have not, if you're not familiar with, with Love is Blind, pretty much it's a reality show series that I believe offers a very unique perspective of just how complicated romantic relationships in particular can be, right? This show is not to me just um, a source of entertainment that can also serve as a fascinating case study for those of us that are psychologists, not only in human behavior, but emotions and just the dynamics of just love and heartbreak in particular. But the concept of it, for those of you that may not be familiar with it, is it challenges participants pretty much to form deep connections and potentially find like lasting love all without ever seeing each other face to face. There literally is like a wall between them. They can hear each other's voices. They can't see each other. They're in these isolated pods and the participants communicate and form these bonds that pretty much are driven by conversations and emotional connection rather than any type of physical attraction, right? So the ultimate human experience um, of behavior and connection and emotions. But the show's premise provides what I call that compelling exploration of that, old, that age old question, right? Is love truly blind, <laughs> right? The, 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 hence the name of the show. But can meaningful relationships truly be built on emotional compatibility alone? Or does physical attraction really play a significant role? And at the end, I want to open this up and maybe some of you can share some of your um, personal experiences. But pretty much what I want to highlight, and if you haven't watched it or you're not familiar with the show, it's okay, even though I may be saying some names, it's the uh, lessons that I want you to pay attention to because there were some valuable lessons from the show's couples. And th these lessons can also reflect on your own relationships or perhaps some things that you can improve on, or perhaps if you're gonna be dating, whatever that may be, to really have an open conversation with you, yourself, your partner, with your friends that we can glean from. So first thing, Jeremy, Sarah Ann, and Laura. <laughs> there was a dynamics of this, I'll, I'll call it a love triangle just to demonstrate for those that may have not watched the show, but they pretty much showed the dynamics of what healthy versus unhealthy relationships are all about. When we think about Jeremy and Sarah Ann and, Sarah Ann and Laura, right? So Jeremy had picked Laura as his partner to he was going to move on towards a potential marital relationship from behind the wall. But there were some really important things that we can learn. And I'm just going to highlight them. I could probably go on and on and on about it. But for a short period of time, I'm just going to highlight the points. Is that when you are in a relationship and you are forming a relationship with someone, it is imperative that you tell the truth. <laughs> simple. Doesn't it sound so simple? But you have to tell your truth to the people who you're investing in a relationship with. You want to walk in integrity and you also want to confront each other respectfully, as we've seen in the season, Laura confronting 
um, Jeremy about his deception about going and spending time with Sarah Ann and he tried to lie about it, but she was also able to track him willingly because he'd given his uh, location. But even knowing that he still did not tell the truth and he tried to downplay and dismiss her concerns about him spending time with his other love interests. So we wanna tell the truth, we wanna walk in integrity and you wanna confront each other with respect because we also know in the world of psychology is one of the predictors from John Gottman of the demise of a relationship is not necessarily all the, the ways in which it comes out, fights about money, fights about other, other people, these types of things. It is the habitual avoidance of conflict. Let me say that again. We can predict the demise of a relationship by the habitual avoidance of conflict. It's the stuff that you don't deal with. It's the stuff that you're hiding. It's the stuff that's underneath the carpet, so to speak. So people sometimes will even come into therapy and they'll say, you know, Christina, oh, that we don't fight. We don't fight. We don't, we don't get into a fight. We only have this one little thing. Well, just because you're telling me you don't get into a fight doesn't necessarily mean to me that you have a healthy relationship, right? So anyway, let's keep it moving. I won't keep, I won't, uh, Hark on that point. But this trio, I'm talking about Jeremy, Sarah Ann, and Laura, as we look at Love is Blind, season six, you know, they, that trio really underscores to me the importance of starting a relationship on a solid foundation of honesty, of respect. And as the saying goes, how you start can be a predictor of how it's going to end. All right. So let me leave that alone. So then let's move on to Trevor. Trevor, to me, embodied the consequences of deception. So think about in your own personal journeys and your relationships, how you've shown up or how you haven't shown up. Have you been deceptive at times? Were there lessons that you've learned about not being honest? Because when we look at Trevor's uh, storyline, so to speak, in Love is Blind, it, to me, serves as a cautionary tale about the repercussions of acting without integrity. He, to me, I can't say it any other way, his deceptive game playing and overlapping relationships was a classic sign of toxic behavior. He entered this show. He already was dealing with another woman um, and the text messages were, sh were, were shared. And then he entered this show with trying to make a love connection with someone else while he was also promising someone else that, that pretty much he was going to return to that person and engage in a relationship with them. So when his actions were exposed, and you can see it if you didn't watch it yesterday on the reunion show, Trevor was left speechless, right? He was, on a, he was not able to explain or justify his actions. So th this scenario to me highlights the ultimate downfall of deception. And as the saying also goes, Monty, the truth always comes out in the end. What's done in the dark will be shed in the light, will be shown in the light. So not we want to learn the lesson that people have feelings, people have emotions. And when we play with people's feelings, we play these games, depending on what you believe, it will come back to you. And in this case, he was exposed for the world to see. So caution for any women <laughs> that are going to be dating Trevor and that are going to be going after him. He's already shown who he is and you want to believe it. All right. So AD and Clay, to me, the power of just being authentic and the power of healing could be demonstrated from their relational dynamics or the lessons that we can learn from their relational dynamics is what I will say. Because when we look at Clay in particular in this, um, in, in this particular situation, there's a strong need for healing. You know, Clay struggled with his unhealed wounds from his father's infidelity. And what that demonstrated to us was how hurt people can hurt people. When we don't heal stuff that's inside of us or we don't heal the pain points that we come into relationships with, it will show up one way or the other. And there's a lot of truth to that saying, hurt people hurt people. When we are still wounded and we haven't healed and we try to enter into relationships with other people, and this can even to a certain degree, extend to friendships is that it will come out, whether it's through insecurity, whether it's through distrust, whether it's through, you know, your own deceptive ways, we become as sick as our secrets. And what Clay had this demonstrated in 
them spotlighting him on Love is Blind season six was that when he was a younger boy, he shared the story of when his father was cheating and having infidelity on his mom and his mom had no idea. His father would bring him along when he would be meeting with the other women. And Clay never disclosed that to his mom, but he had to keep that secret. And what he was watching, his father's actions, my assumption would be he was learning distrust. He was learning that love is not pure. He was learning deceptive ways. He was learning the player game, however we want to say it. And it wasn't until later in life he he, he exposed or, or shared with his mom what he experienced as a young boy. So that generational trauma is real. The things that we were exposed to, the things that we went through, if we can't speak life to it, if we cannot work through it and do the work to understand how those things affect us, sometimes people try to will their way. Well, I'm just not going to be like my father. My father was this, my father was that. So I'm going to go the other way. But doing the work is it's not just trying to avoid whatever you saw, because the very thing that you try not to do could be the very thing that you do, unless you understand how that unconscious mess, how those messages got, were now caught in your unconscious life and how it's going to show up for you. You have to understand the meaning, how it's affected you. What did you learn from it? And a lot of that stuff is sometimes not, it's not in our conscious mind, which is why we have to take time to examine, right? Is what about that saying the life exam, the life that goes unexamined, we have to examine our life. It's not to again, ever blame or to go back and, you know, become a victim of our circumstances, but it's to learn. So when I looked at Clay and, and AD, you know, their open conversation about his issues highlights the importance of addressing and healing from our past traumas in order to truly build a healthier relationship. And a couple of things I'll say about what I've observed about AD, you know, she seemed to be a very solid woman who knew what she wanted and who showed up with all of her ready to enter into a long-term relationship. But one of the things that I would say to her, if she was sitting here in front of me in, in, in hindsight, is that again, when people show you who they are and they tell you who they are, believe them. Clay had shared multiple times of his fear about becoming his father and his fear about entering relationship. But sometimes, Someone like an AD is so set on wanting their picture, wanting their day, wanting their fairy tale that you can miss some of the signs that maybe this person isn't ready, even though I'm not, even though I'm ready. And you cannot love someone enough. You cannot sex someone enough, enough. You cannot compliment them enough. You can't build them up enough if they're not ready to do the work. Because then you're entering into trying to build, build a man. All right. Or that Ikea effect. You're trying to put the furniture together to make something of it. But then in the end, she got hurt and he could have handled that things a lot differently. He left her literally at the altar. And regardless of what he probably was saying, you he knew coming up to her on the altar and going through all the motions. If he really was going to go through it or not, I find it hard to believe that in that particular moment that it became clear to him that he wasn't ready to be married. But at the end of the day, he's the one that looked like the fool. All right, let's move on. Jimmy and Chelsea, right? What they demonstrated, lots of things that we can break around, what we can learn from this particular couple. But what I'll highlight is the importance of trust. You know, Jimmy and Chelsea, you know, their storyline reminds me of that critical role of how trust truly plays in relationship, especially when you're building a relationship. So there's many things that I can say about their relationship. But one thing I want to highlight is when Chelsea used the secret that Jimmy had told her off camera about him having a um, one of his good female friends about him having had a previous sexual relationship with her and that that was in the past and they were just completely friends now. And he shared that with Chelsea off camera because she actually met him. So he felt like, you know, this is the woman I'm potentially going to marry. So she needs to know that this friend I did have a history with. But Chelsea admitted last night in season six uh, reunion that she had a lot of insecurities. And if you watched the season, you saw that <laughs> you saw those insecurities play out on camera. So let that be a lesson learned to you. When you have insecurities, 
you're going to, it's going to affect your relationship because when you have insecurities about trust or you have insecurities about other people, you're going to become hyper-focused. Sometimes the things that we fear are the things that we see. But anyway, so Chelsea had used the secret that Jimmy had shared with her against him during an argument. So what she did was she brought something that she promised that will stay off camera on camera as a weapon. She weaponized it in their argument to pretty much try to make her point. And in that moment, she broke his trust. So what we saw was that by her breaking his trust, that that incident underscored the fact that once trust is broken and think about this, if someone has ever broken your trust, whether it was in your romantic relationship, whether it was a family member, whether it was a friend, once trust is broken, it can be very, very difficult to rebuild it. Because what happens is every truth now becomes questionable. Every truth becomes questionable when someone lies to you or someone breaks your trust. So when someone gives us their trust, they give us the most vulnerable parts of them, how we show up and how we hold space for that is more of an indication about us than it is about them. So are you a trustworthy person? And if you give your word or if you made a commitment not to do something and then you, when it was convenient for you to use it to weaponize someone and then want to apologize and expect them to move on, it's not that easy. So the importance of trust in building relationship. Easy to build, harder to rebuild. All right. So Brittany and Kenneth, what their relationship brought to me to kind of highlight it was the value of presence. Again, many things I can say about this couple, but when I wanted to pull out a lesson uh, for you, it was the value of presence. You know, Brittany and Kenneth, what we watched on screen is their interactions reminded us about giving respect and attention, Natasha, right? When we think about attention and respect to the person who's in front of us, our, in, our real life relationships, Raquel, that this dynamic really, a lot of things, but one of the things that they highlighted was showing that when once Kenneth got his phone back, Debbie, he could not get off that phone. <laughs> Regardless of his excuses, he could not get off the phone and his device became a distraction to their relationship. So how many of you right now, not to answer it, but to reflect on it, are in a relationship where maybe you're at dinner, maybe you're watching a show, maybe you're trying to connect with your partner, your spouse, your husband, your wife, and they're connected to their phone. You're talking to them and they're looking at their phone and, and you're like, oh, are, are you hearing me? And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or they're not even taking their eyes off of their phone to have the conversation with you. Just think about how that feels, especially if you're in the receiver seat of that. Because devices and devices can be a real distraction. And the lesson that I want you to learn is that real connection requires our presence. Our phone, whatever's on our phone, text messages, you can get to them but the person who's right in front of you to give them the present of your presence, especially in today when we have so many distractions and many people, because of our distractions, we become addicted to the false sense of connection. When we get the dings, the notifications, all these other things, we feel so important that we can neglect our child that's in front of us, our partner who's in front of us, our husband, our wife, or at dinner with a friend, whatever it may be. So their dynamic il illustrated to me how processing information is also unique to each individual, how they process that relationship. It underlines the importance of patience and understanding and communication. And another lesson that I'll say that I observed from what we were seeing with Brittany and Kenneth was their transition from romantic relationship to friendship in this season six. It also shows us that people can transition from a romantic relationship to a friendship. And it doesn't have to be toxic. It doesn't have to be toxic. It doesn't have to have tension. It doesn't have to have all these hard, you know, feelings that it's possible to redefine a relationship in a healthy way, respectful way, respectful manner. Both people can be open to change and, and willing to navigate a transition with care. 
And I wish that we would see this a lot more with co-parenting when people are divorcing. At some point in time, you were romantically attracted to each other. There was respect to each other. You got together for a certain for a certain reasons. You tried to build something. But when things change between the two of you and you could no longer rebuild and you had to move in different directions, it doesn't have to be toxic. It doesn't have to be toxic at all. And I'm also, I also embody that, right? In a co-parenting relationship, it does not have to be toxic. So they embody that for us. And I really hope that we can get more, more of that as people move to different relationships, especially when children are involved. So a couple things that I want to say when I kind of conclude my quick synopsis of The Love is Blind at season six, you know, it presented a lot of different complexities when it comes to relationship lessons. But when we look at, especially when we're looking at certain reality shows that are showing and experiments, and this one is one of them, experiments of, of Love is Truly Blind, it can also help you. It can help all of us better understand and be introspective of our own relationships, our own dynamics, and to confront our own issues and to strive for healthier and more fulfilling relationships. Because what I also underscore by watching the show is we can get into so many conversations about the other person, what we want the other person to be, how we want them to show up, how we want to feel, all these other things, which are all important, 100% are important. But on the other hand, I would highly, highly suggest that you consider how do you show up in relationship? How do you want to show up in a relationship? And can you give the very things that you want? Or if you are married right now, is your spouse, is your husband, is your wife, or if you're in a relationship, your partner, are they getting the best of you? Or was that left at the beginning? Was that left at the altar? Was that left in the dating stage? Because that's more of a reflection of you. When we get comfortable with people, can we still get in a, be in a position where we still let them know that you value them, that you respect them, that you love them? Or when they show up at their worst, how can you show up at the table with grace, with compassion, with understanding, but also when you need to have boundaries? As we we're talking about with, with AD and Clay, when someone keeps telling you that what they're struggling with, they're struggling with, are you going to be so attached to the outcome that you miss? that they are telling you the very thing that you may come into counter with in the future. Because I truly believe AD dodged a bullet there. You cannot cure someone in a relationship. You cannot change them. And you do not cause them the three C's. Change, cure, and cause them to show up with the wounds that they showed up with that was before you. If they're willing to do the work and they're willing to work through things, then you can journey with them. It's called a growth mindset. Are they willing to be introspective? Are they willing to look at themselves? Or what happens when you come across someone like Trevor, who was deceptive and playing games? Can you have a boundary and walk away and not willing to play? So I want to hear from a few people on a, at the breakfast table, I mean, if you watch the show, what were some of your takeaways or what are some of the lessons, relationship lessons when you showing up today in today's world and your age and stage of life that you look back and say some of your greatest relationship lessons that you can share with us at the breakfast table? Go ahead and open your mic, say your name. What's your lesson or what's your takeaway? Good morning. Hi, Dr. Jane. This is Raquel Lett Anderson. And this is a great conversation. I have watched uh, Love is Blind in the past, and um, I did not watch this season. But one of the takeaways that I know is so true for me is really listening to a person. They always tell you what they like. They always tell you who they are. And whether or not you want to... Um, have that person in your life or not, you have to understand what you like and what you want. Because if it's not matching, there's gonna be there's gonna be conflict and there's gonna be um and if it's not what you need, 
understand what you need going into a relationship to see if that person compliments you. That's the main thing that I want to say, because they always show signs. Um, if there's, if there's things that there's just not right, just, just you win, you win early. If you find out that through conversation, through, um, through going on dates or just, uh, who they who they surround themselves with they're not going to change that's one thing i was in a marriage for 32 years and they never changed thank you so very much for this conversation thank you raquel you said it when you listen to people and you're listening to people to to learn them you will also understand their values is what i was hearing raquel say and you want to have more similarities, especially when it comes to, to values than differences. You need to have some differences that they bring something to the table. But sometimes we can attract, we, we, we are attracted so much to the outcome of what we want that we miss that someone has told us what they like and what whatever it may be. And then we're constantly, potentially if you've been in relationships like this and you're constantly trying to get that person to match what you want them to be versus just accepting them, radically accepting them as Raquel was saying, for who they are. And at that point, you have a choice. But the longer you're investing in someone and the longer you're investing in trying to change them, all right, you need to know not necessarily the, the good parts and the attraction parts, but what are the things that you're, you're gonna settle for something. So are you willing to settle for those things that they may be struggling with or the things that they may like and you think you're gonna change it, so to speak. So thank you, Raquel, I appreciate you. And who else wants to make a comment? Hey, 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 Dr. Go ahead. Go ahead, oh, no, I'm sorry. I was going to say, I watched this show and um, I saw some things this season and Chelsea was like the old me, really insecure. And when Ken would pick up the phone, it made me so uncomfortable that I think we can, um, you know, it's just when we mirror back some of those things in these shows, you see them, it brings attention. And I know that's a behavior that, I do not ever want to repeat. So I had to do the work. I just recognized her, her in me like 10 years ago, but I want to leave space for TM real quick too. Yes, absolutely. Mary Lynn, right. That um, insecurity shows up as control. It shows up as, yes. you know, overly um, accusing and trying to see things that are not there. So we have to work on our insecurities no matter where we are in our life, we all have them, but you need to bring them to awareness so that when they show up, you know how to manage them. Thank you, Mary Lynn. Good morning, TM. Hey, my friend, this has been great. You know, thank you for this recap. You said what we fear is what we see and always be honest. I think a lot of times we're not honest because we fear how people are going to respond. But I've learned that when you're honest, right, people may not like it, but they respect it. Um, and, and the outcome is way different. And so this has been great. Thank you. We, we absolutely see what we fear. Back to you. Yes. And TM recapped it well. So we need to understand the things that we fear because those are the things that we try to hide and we try to show up and put our best foot forward. But what he said was a very, very valuable lesson. People value truth tellers. People value those that come to the table with honesty and how you are honest and how you tell the truth in your authentic nature. You will attract people who will value integrity. So with that being said, have a great Therapy Thursday. And I'm going to turn it over to my sister, Lolita. Good morning, Lolita. Good morning, good morning, good morning. What a fabulous segment. I'm so excited to be here to 